number of years ago, I was in a little town, Darjeeling, on the northern boundary of India, where it met Tibet. And there were several visitors from various countries, and the hotel management decided it would be appropriate to give a little entertainment in the Tibetan uh, spirit. So they brought in about a half a dozen Tibetan dancers with their masks and regalia uh, to entertain. And among them was a little boy about eight years old. A very cute, chubby little rascal, and everyone liked immediately. But when the time for the dance came, <clears throat> he put on one of the most grotesque masks you'd ever want to see. He really was, it looked like a nightmare. And of course, everyone knew it was the little boy. But during the dance, he started and moved over very rapidly towards the audiences, always getting ready to attack them. And you should have seen the audience scatter. <laughs> They all knew it was a little boy, but with the mask, something happened. And uh, a real spirit of ancient and primary fear moved in on those people. Uh, they actually, subconsciously, were terrified. On another occasion, I remember in the Japanese no drama where the principal actors are masked. Many of the themes are highly sacred. And in the various performances, uh, the actors are nearly always concealed behind uh, these wood-carved masks that are well-painted and decorated, but of course have no expression except that of the original carving. But under a careful handling of lights, particularly by the postures of the head in relationship to the source of light, these faces seem to change. And in moments of joy, the face really seemed to smile. And in sorrow, the face looked very tragic. And yet it was done with a wooden mask, but everyone felt it. Uh, the skill with which the mask was handled was the principal factor. In the southwest of the United States, we have a series of ritualistic dances by the various Indian tribes, the Zunis, Hopis, Navajo. These dances often include masked figures, and everyone knows that these masked figures are members of the local community. One of the men with a mask, a very carefully developed, rather, rather crude mask concealment, actually uh, has two children in the audience. They all know that it's father, but when he dances toward them with a sacred pollen, they kneel instinctively as though he was a god. Something happens when the masks begin to take apart in religious ritual. Masks were used in Egypt, we know, in the temple mysteries. And even today, the various uh, carvings and manuscripts of Egyptian origin show human beings with the masks of birds and animals. The Greeks used masks in their theater also. Nearly always, a mask becomes a complete change of personality. If accompanied by adequate religious ritual, the mask becomes the secret of the development of a peculiar theological belief that there was a divine power in the mask. And when it was worn correctly and under ritual supervision, it brought a deity into contact with humanity. Well, in the course of time, the mask cults have gradually faded, but in many primitive countries, they still survive. Then came another step forward in the study of human psychology. It is almost impossible for the average person to understand a completely abstract principle. 
It is very hard to visualize something that has no form or to visualize an energy which is completely unembodied. From very early times, it became apparently necessary to present nearly all of the important truths of life symbolically. We have uh, wonderful symbolic books like Aesop's Fables or Pilgrim's Progress. We have very wonderful ancient sculpturing and statuary, paintings, carvings of all kinds, retablos and icons, which are presumed to have certain sacred value in themselves. You can go from one end of the world to the other among a middle-class group of people, the average person, and you ask them if they believe that these statues are actually divine or have spiritual power in themselves. And nearly everyone will answer no. Even in the midst of a vast array of this imagery, nearly everyone accepts the fact that it is symbolical, that it represents something that cannot be directly seen. It, de it de represents a, a power in nature which is in itself invisible. The idea of this type of symbolism apparently arose from man's study of his own environment. It gradually dawned upon him that pure life in its own essence is invisible. We know it is present because of what it does, but we do not know what it is. Therefore, when we begin to study life, we have to do it by examining living things. We are not able to understand the substance of energy or vitality or force, but we are able to estimate its consequences. Therefore, as we look around us in nature, we see an infinite diversity of living things. All of these living things supported by one essential basic life principle. Under such conditions, it must become obvious that this life principle has many appearances. It has as many forms and appearances as forms and appearances exist in nature. It is not only represented by picture, it is represented by sound or color. It is represented by mathematical formulas and astronomical observations. And it is represented by now a very complex group of chemical and electronic symbols. And yet underneath all of this vast array of symbolism, it is obvious that there is one invisible life principle. And this principle, separated from all living things, is almost impossible to define. The only way we can define it is to reveal it through its own works. And our ancient forebears were certain that all creation was a revelation of one principle. Therefore, in order to make a diagram or a picture of this principle, something had to be found that could be equated with everything that exists. This symbol had to be inclusive enough to reveal the utter diversity of the divine power, and yet at the same time sufficiently integrated to realize or to represent the fact that this divine power was in the ultimate one, an indivisible principle manifesting constantly through utter diversity. It therefore seemed quite proper to select various symbols to represent this one indivisible but invisible unity at the source of existence. The Greeks had their pantheons of gods, so did the Egyptians and the Latins. The Hindus had a vast mass of celestial beings. Buddhism has its Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and Arhats. 
and nearly all religions and philosophies have behind the visible orders of things the concept of an invisible government, a government which controls all things because it is by its very substance and essence in full possession of everything necessary for absolute leadership. All of this type of philosophy has gradually resulted in what we might term religious art. And this religious art is not limited to strange peoples far away. It is present in our own cathedrals and churches. Religious art is present in many private homes. Wonderful figures and representations of sacred persons or sanctified individuals are to be found in painting and in sculpturing in our own local environment. How then does it happen that we create this imagery? Uh, artists, particularly in the early period of Gothic art in Europe, invented a complete language of symbolical attributes by means of which it would be possible to distinguish the degrees of sanctity or divinity present in the various representations that they made. Whether it is the great Michelangelo's Moses or the tremendous uh, symbolical value of the Raphael and Rembrandt sacred paintings, it's always the same. A sacred picture to represent an invisible principle. Now, this is also the only way that we can represent the various virtues and vices of humanity. How are we going to define generosity to a person who has no understanding of the word? A, the only way we can understand under those conditions is through an action. And so we have the uh, various parables and legends of scriptures. The Good Samaritan represents this kind of generosity. The wayward son who finally comes home to his family is in the parable of the prodigal son. Well, these are word patterns created to express virtues which are common to human beings but which cannot be communicated without some relationship to a practical action. As we go into the pictures of religious personalities in all parts of the world, we are sometimes considerably confused. In many instances, it looks like some people have more of these images than might be necessary. We realize also that within cultures, these images change their appearances. They change the materials upon which or from which they are fashioned. They develop expressions and likenesses largely tribal or racial, and therefore differing in various areas and communities. Yet this tremendous, almost incalculable mass of sacred imagery is now becoming of great interest to not only the psychologist, but the anthropologist and the mystic, the metaphysician, and the symbolist in general because these images tell us something. They tell us of man's eternal search for realities. And the very images which look unreal are part of this struggle to attain reality. Some time ago, an Indian gentleman, East Indian gentleman, was discussing with a missionary who was having a little difficulty trying to understand how this well-cultured Indian gentleman was able to respect an image with a number of arms and several heads. So the, he tried to explain this to the missionary. And he said, uh, uh, how now would you do some of these things? Suppose we say that a horse has a head, and a dog has a head, and a bird has a head, and a fish has a head. Now, all these heads are parts of something. They are parts of life. All of these creatures are alive. One life is within them. 
Therefore, if we want to make a picture of life, we must make a cluster of living things to represent it. And no matter how many of these put, we put together or pile up, they will not be adequate because there will be more kinds of life than we can picture. There will be more attitudes and virtues within human life than we can depict. Therefore, the only thing we can do is to suggest that the divine power, the source of things, animates all life. And therefore, if we try to picture it, perhaps we should picture it made up of living things. In Egypt, the Serapian deity in the uh, great Alexandrian library, the Serapium, is said to have been a deity, a figure, in a, made of a kind of wicker work. And within that wicker work, were all forms of life, plants, flowers, symbols of animals and birds, all kinds of things. It was a wicker work filled with every type of life that the Egyptians could put in it. Therefore, to them, it seemed perfectly appropriate that this should represent the spirit of life, a spirit moving through living things, a spirit that should remind us forever of the unity of life and our own kinship with living things. So gradually it became increasingly uh, practical, apparently, to create this elaborate pictorial representation of the various activities of natural law. In Alexandria, the astronomers tried to do this with the universe. The Brahmins perhaps did a little better at it, but all of them came to the realization that the universe was in some way an archetypal figure, a pattern, a picture. And if we wanted to picture the divine power of the source of life, what more adequate immediate symbol could be available than the solar system, the cosmos? There would be no way in which we could go beyond life. But everything we can reach is part of life. Therefore, life expands and extends. And as the Brahmins pointed out, the main problem with imagery is that it is inadequate. It is not that we have too much of it. It is that we cannot possibly have an imagery structure that is complete in all of its attributes. There was only a step then to take language as an example. Language was a way of putting forms into words and transmitting them. Language could go on and on and on, and never could we have enough words or enough language symbols to take care of everything we wanted to record. In the 15th and 16th century, the unabridged dictionary was a very slender little volume in English. Today it is an inconceivably complicated volume. And still there are not enough words to tell all that we know. In the same way, there are not enough symbols in nature to tell all that we believe about creation, about deity, about the infinite unfoldment of living things. So we find in the Greek and other religions also the gradual development of mythologies. These mythologies were stories about the gods or about spirits, or ghosts, or superphysical beings of one kind or another. Now, in mythology, how are we going to symbolize the processes by means of which the various unfoldments of life took place? To the ancient people, without exception, generation was the most important symbol that existed to their knowledge, for it was a way in which life was perpetuated. It was the one way in which the uh, mystery of death is solved forever in eternal life. Therefore, all the processes of creation that we might now carry on in a laboratory by means of chemicals or mathematical symbols were anciently represented by the ordinary activities of human life. Therefore, to the primitive people, deity was a tribal chieftain. Now, they knew he wasn't. There's no evidence whatever that the ancients were truly ignorant of this. 
All they knew was that they had to have a symbol. They had to have something. So deity had to be parent, because parent was the most important, valuable, and venerated thing in the material world. And as a family was a social unit to carry on the processes of life in this world, so it was only a step of understanding or interpretation to realize that the great collective, the entire cosmos, the absolute unity of all life, was also a family. And that by means of using the symbolism of family, we began to understand the motivations which might dominate creative processes. The family became, therefore, our natural home. Children respect their parents, admire them if they were worthy of admiration, and sometimes even if they are not because of traditional allegiances. But family in all of its aspects becomes a basis of culture, and the Chinese were especially uh, avid in their symbolism, using the family as the symbol of the home, of the community, of the nation, of the race, of the universe. All these were families. All of them were ruled over by matriarchies or patriarchies. Another interesting point in connection with this is that as we go further and further back, the same thing happens that still occurs very frequently in family life. And that is, gradually, the mother takes the supreme position. Uh, the Emperor Julian, in his oration to the mother of the gods, and many other ancient symbols and systems, convey the clear indication that the maternal principle was the most important. In Egypt, all of the great families, especially the pharaohs, all were uh, measured from the mother's side of the house. The name descended from the mother, and matriarchy was also the basic uh, philosophical and political structure of the American Indians, especially the Iroquois League. Always the mother was the guardian, the brood, and the symbol of, of generation, procreation, and the fertility of God. Even today, it has been noted with some interest that in Christianity, there are very few, if any, known churches uh, that are dedicated primarily to God the Father. They are all to either Christ or the Virgin Mary. Although, of course, later the saints come in, both male and female, into cathedral naming. But the great majority of religious belief in medieval Catholicism was centered upon Mary the Mother. In, in uh, Japan and China, the Indian Bodhisattva, uh, Alvalakitesvara, was a male being. But in Japan and China, it was feminized, and mercy was personified as the goddess Kannan or Kuan Yin. And this was the mercy of the eternal. It was the attribute of everlastingness. And every virtue, every desirable quality, gradually became embodied in something. Embodied in a being that more or less exemplified all of the virtue of that particular attribute, whichever it might be. Wherever there was a great need for mercy, compassion, and understanding, the image of this power had to emerge as an experience of the people. They could not live without it. We also have other things that had to be personalized, such as justice. Justice, we know, is not a person, and yet justice has been personified many times in different nations and races by an appropriate symbol, very often the deity Jupiter or Zeus. Now it so happens that from the mythology, uh, Zeus might not have been all that justice ought to be. 
There are some reports to the contrary. But when we have justice here, it isn't always all that it ought to be. Wherever man created an image to represent a divine power, he embodied in it somewhere the weakness of himself. It couldn't be perfect. The image could never be the perfection. It could only be a symbol of something greater than itself. The human being with his strength and his weakness, with his hopes and his fears, uh, with his constant striving for security in a material existence, all these elements created theologies. They all created great systems of gods and godlings and angels suitable to bring certain ideas to the people. In the most of the ancient religions, there were what we call heroes. And heroes were ordinary mortals who by some virtue were lifted to an almost divine estate. The Greek heroes such as Hercules and uh, Ulysses, Achilles and uh, Orpheus, these were great hero beings, yet they were born of the flesh. They were mortal, but they became immortal, and therefore became the immortal mortals. They inhabited a region between heaven and earth, and every faith and religion has had them in some form. Intercessors between man and that which was superior to himself. Also teachers, because every human being has to go to school. And when he graduates from a school here, it's obvious that he is not really enlightened. But he still has to study. Therefore, the concept of the school was expanded and extended so that to the mystically minded, school lasted for the entire lifetime. And the most important experiences of schooling were those experienced in mature life. But actually, there were always teachers, always intercessors between the weak humanity and the divine power that fashioned all things. One good example of this intercession is found in Egypt. The one and only beloved son of Osiris, the god of the quick and the dead, was Horus, the hawk-headed. Not always represented with the hawk's head, however, but he was the head of the army of the sacred hawks, their Shesti, who were to fight the last great war against evil. And this being, Horus, appears with his father in the various uh, papyri of the Book of the Dead. This was the book or manuscript buried with those who had passed on and containing symbolically the story of the afterlife, which also became another very important system of symbolism. But in this particular case, the, the soul of the deceased comes into the Hall of Judgment to be weighed against truth. Now, it wasn't assumed that the uh, deceased was perfect, and it was accepted, however, that certain imperfections were inevitable, but in the main and large, he must have kept the rules of human decency. He must have been honorable and honest. He must be able to recite the negative confession of faith without lying, exaggerating, or misrepresenting because he was doing this in the presence of the jury. And our jury system is first seen on the Egyptian monuments and has continued to the present time, with the judge in our system representing Osiris. Actually, when the soul was weighed and was found to be wanting a little too much or not quite good enough for preservation in the land of the blessed, at that moment, Horus, this only begotten, came into the presence of his father and plead, pled for the soul. He asked that Osiris take upon himself, that is, upon Horus, the son, the sin of the offending soul. Let him expiate the sin and let the soul go on to peace. 
So this was part of the Egyptian ritual because they had to have some of these things themselves. They had to explain life. They also had to explain what happens to their minds when the individual passed on. Where did he go? According to the Egyptian belief, if he was reasonably virtuous, he went into the Elysian fields. He went into the beautiful land of the blessed dead. But the fact that he went there did not necessarily change him. Because in the land of the dead, the Nile always overflowed its banks. The crop, the crop was always abundant. But the souls of the dead all worked. The death was not a symbol of sitting back somewhere and trying to play a musical instrument. <laughs> death was to live in a world as beautiful as Egypt, but ruled by divine law so that there could be no sin and no crime. And every individual had the right to earn his own way and have the security that he had earned, and nothing and no one could take it from him. So according to what he was, he went on to the fields of the blessed. And there's a story of the banker who, uh, after day, was an honest banker. He did very well. He passed the examination and went on to the afterlife. But he was a banker. And, of course, there's no banking over there. So he did what was happening was very simple. After all, whether you're a banker or a farmer or anything else is all in yourself. You are what you believe you are. Therefore, this man believed he was a banker. And this, as a result of this believing, he found himself in the other world, seated comfortably at a table with his scales and everything in front of him, making money, changing currency, doing all the services of banking, and going on and enjoying life until it came, back, it came time for him to come back again into embodiment. As an honest man, he became a happy banker because that's what he wanted to be. The priest wanted to be a better priest. The philosopher wanted to be a greater philosopher. But each life and each embodiment and each attainment was according to the need and to the acceptances of the person. The more advanced the individual was, the more lofty the afterlife. But where it was very simple, it could still be very beautiful. And the Egyptians figured that the farmer had just as good a heaven and just as much happiness as the greatest priest. Each was in the condition that fulfilled its own needs. And these needs, as they grew and expanded through time, were fulfilled by right conduct. So all this symbolism is found carved on the temple walls, found in the ancient manuscripts, and in the records that have descended from scholars who lived in those days. Thus we have all kinds of symbols. We have everything that is necessary to some way make life significant to the person. Today we have a great belief and a great need of believing in integrities that are more important than the mistakes that we make every day. But in the course of time, something has happened that is a little unfortunate, I think, because others may disagree with me. I think it's a, mis a misfortune that we have lost this world of fairy tales, this world of symbols, this marvelous, adventurous realm in which virtue does survive and does succeed, and those who live well live happily ever after. This world was part of something that was a deeper believing than we have today, and probably came nearer to believing true than the beliefs that we do cherish in our modern society. There seems to be a lack of the love of beauty, of the recognition of the divine warmth of existence. We have become so interested in laws, so interested in processes, so much concerned with computerizations, that we have forgotten the beauty, the dignity, of a universe of gentle, constructive emotions, a universe in which love and friendship and understanding, security, mutual helpfulness were the great ideas and the great ideals. Now, where you had a, a mystical theology, it was easy to sustain those concepts, even though some, of course, always disobeyed them. But the general a group of persons lived hopefully, 
and lived with a full understanding that somewhere in space there was an orderliness which would protect and preserve them. Their belief in God made them sharers in a divinely guided world, a universe of eternal benevolence. As we gradually lost track of this, as the gods seemed to retire to their distant Olympian thrones, and the world was left open to politicians and economists and industri industrialists, something went wrong. The wonderful overtones were lost and are now generally regarded as superstitions. It is considered now a superstition to believe in the presence of this eternally divine power. And yet, if we look out at life and get a little ways off from our own narrow particulars with which we are concerned, this universe of beauty, this universe of love and friendship, this universe of life does still exist. It is everywhere. Every natural process that makes up the vast pageantry of existence is essentially a beautiful process. It is meritorious, it is gentle, it is kind. And all the uh, mistakes that we make some way get cleared up. We do solve the problems, we do go on, and most persons do dream of life to come and of better conditions than they know now. All of this was a heritage from the past. It was all believed, and people lived according to it. Today, your anthropologist will say that they were very childish. And yet, maybe they were childish. But Jesus said of children, that of them is the kingdom of God. And the same thought occurs in the writings of, chi of Chinese philosophers, especially Mencius and Lao Tzu. The child heart is the thing we have lost. And we've lost with it the fairy tale and the legend. We've lost Hans Christian Andersen and the Brothers Grimm. We have lost a world of fantasy, which unfortunately faded away but has never actually been disproved. That there might be beauty that we don't recognize. That there may be love that we don't know how to experience. These things are there, but we have gradually lost contact with them. I remember Burbank told me one afternoon in Santa Rosa, he said, you think you've got five senses and that you're pretty smart because you have them. And I'm convinced that he, from my own researches, that animals and plants have more than 20 sensory perceptions, more than we have, but not focused in the same level as ours. They have the worlds of their own. And in those worlds, laws that are beautiful and kind and good are operating. We may not be able to understand them. And our treatment of these various creatures does not show understanding in many instances. But that all forms of life have hope, have some internal power within themselves. Burbank used to talk to his plants, and they did what he wanted them to. They sent students from the universities up to Santa Rosa, and they did everything that Burbank did, but they wouldn't bother to talk to the plants, and theirs died. The only one, apparently, who was ever able to really carry it on successfully was an old Chinese gardener that Burbank had. The Chinese gardener got down on his knees and had heart-to-heart -heart talks with the calla lily, and it did what he wanted it to do. But all the high... Uh, specialized students with great knowledges of botany and horticulture got nowhere. And the world of make-believe, so-called, is very largely a world of love, a world in which things are more beautiful than we thought they were, a world in which something very warm and very close, and very divine, is near us at all times. And our ancient forebears were really almost able to see these things. I remember these in the, one of the dialogues of Socrates that he and his disciples gathered in a grove by the side of the road to have scholarly discourse. And Socrates asked the disciples to join him in prayer.
to the muses and the nymphs and the hamadryads in that woods that they would come and share knowledge with him. He believed in these things, and he was one of the world's great philosophical thinkers. We have gradually cut off the invisible. We have made it so unreal. And why have we done this? Because we feel that we have outgrown the old symbolism. We feel that the imagery of the past was not good enough, or that we have outgrown the idea that the gods of India gathered in session on the peak of Miru. We do not believe these things, nor do we believe that they were on the peak of Olympus, because too many people now have climbed Olympus and there's nothing there. So that ends the whole thing. But what all these people have forgotten or overlooked in the whole situation is the tremendous symbolism of it. It wasn't the physical Olympus where the gods lived. It was a symbol of a superior or a higher state of consciousness, something that rose like a majestic mountain peak with snow and glaciers, something on which the light of the sun shone in many colors. There was a symbolic mountain, a mysterious place somewhere, the axle of the world, where, div where divinity dwelt. And people really believed this. And in some way, they were better for that belief. It was much better for them to have those kind of beliefs because they carried with them certain responsibilities and duties. When you believed in the reality of things unseen, you had to obey what you believed. You had to have courage to live well. If there were gods, you had to so abide with your neighbor that these gods would not punish you, but would reward you with uh, proper abundance and uh, security. Among the American Indians, the, the Siberian shaman, the Shinto of Japan, and many of the folk beliefs of Africa, we had the story of the medicine priest, the born mystic who was the leader of the tribe. In almost all ancient communities, the mystics were the leaders because they were the ones that could speak with the gods. It were the Irish mystics that were able to go into the world of the fairy people under the earth and would carry messages back and forth. Among the, the Hopis, the snake people carry the messages of man to the earth mother, and the thunderbird raises the messages to the sky father. All these things are legends, but they stand for something. They stand for thoughtfulness, for some kind of inner experience of communion. Please turn your cassette to the other side now, and it will continue to play after a brief pause. They stand for thoughtfulness, for some kind of inner experience of communion. The uh, Indian medicine priest was not trained in medicine as we know it. He was not ordained to the ministry. He had none of the physical associations that we would uh, uh, compare with theology today. He was a little boy born in a tribe. Perhaps a family of maybe 50 or 100 people constituted his world. Here he lived. Here he wandered with them from place to place as they moved in search of food. This little boy from a childhood, everyone looked at him. They said he was a very thoughtful child. He seemed to be a little different from most of the others. He was always quiet. He was never much involved in the games of the young people. He was not much interested in hunting or anything of that nature. He would sit and look at the sky, or he would sit and watch the birds flight. He was just a strange lad. As he grew older, he did his vigil, for every Indian had to go out and have a long, heart-to-heart -heart talk with nature. He had to leave even that little small family that he belonged to and go out into the desert or the forest or the wilderness, and there placing his prayer plumes and smoking the pipe 
of sacrament, he would have to sit. Day, sometimes night, he would have to meditate and vigil, sometimes for five or six nights. But always in the end, the vigil was rewarded. The voices came to him. And the voices came to all those little Indian boys and girls. And what was more important still, the voices gave to each one of these his death song. One of the great duties of the voices was to take away forever the fear of death. Why? Because to these Indians, more perhaps than we realize, in their way of life, life swallowed up death. There was only life. Something we can't really say with a full conscience in many cases in our days. But anyway, while he was out there in vigil, he had the vision of the Thunderbird, which was the phoenix. His totem was the great symbol of re regeneration, the bird that rose victoriously from the ashes of its own dead. And if this was the totem that appeared to him, he was the priest. It was then his duty to serve his people as a religious leader. Among these people, as in many other clergies, the garments of the priest always combined male and female raiment. They had a life apart. Prayer and meditation was their way. They consoled the sick, comforted the dying. They performed many secret rites of simple magic, which they understood and knew. They also went out and uh, found the herbs. They didn't learn about herbs from the, another medicine man. They had to go out in vigil and be told these herbs by voices from within themselves voices that they called the voices of the olds and of the trues and of all the wisdom of their people since the beginning of time. And these the old priests had remarkable experiences, and perhaps it can best be summed up in a few words today, is that there's a great deal of difficulty on most Indian reservations to prevent non-Indians from trying to get medical help from the old priests. They would much rather take a chance on the old medicine man than they would with modern science. But in any event, these things were part of a great tradition. The world was filled with life. The Romans had their lairs and panates, spirits that lived under the hearthstone in the kitchen. The Chinese had the equivalent to it also, the Chinese kitchen god. Now, they, everyone would say that that was pretty superstitious. But... Probably that was responsible for the fact that the Chinese and the Romans and Greeks who had these beliefs had very little indigestion. The reason being that if you really were a homemaker, the, and when you went to prepare the meal, these little spirits were there, and they watched you. And when you did the wrong thing, they said, uh-uh, that's not going to be digestible. They also had laws and rules of what man should be fed, and they expected these rules to be obeyed. And most of all, they insisted that the cook be happy. Any grudging cook would to them be a source of, di of indigestion. If you weren't happy, if you didn't sing doing these things, which are the simple acts of life, then everybody was sick or suffered. And the food was tainted by the attitude of the cook. They believed that. It probably wouldn't hurt us any to believe it. It might possibly be of some value. It certainly would improve the general attitudes of families. And under these old mythological systems, families were much closer. Because they had common beliefs and common responsibilities. They held certain truths in common. When the emperor of China, in the old, old days, came to the annual ceremony of giving honor to his father, the celestial emperor in heaven above, he went out alone, took off all of his robes of glory, put on a simple white garment, 
and went alone to pray at the altar of heaven. And there, in a great, very important ritual, the emperor uh, addressing heaven, which he really believed. He believed he was the son of heaven. He believed that he was appointed by heaven to rule his people, and that he ruled by the will of heaven. So when he knelt down, he had a prayer, and it ran a little bit like this in substance. He asked heaven to forgive him the mistakes of life. And if in his country there was hunger, if there was political disturbance, if there was war, uh, if there was contention and discord, intolerance or intemperance, the emperor said to his celestial father, let me carry the blame. I am the ruler. If I have not been able to rule according to the rules of heaven, punish me, not them. For if bad, a nation that is in trouble is in trouble because its leaders have not kept the rules. This was China. And while a lot of people today will not believe in Shang-Ti, imperial heaven, there are some practical aspects of that subject that might be given further consideration as to what constitutes the source of the responsibility for the tranquility and peace of a country. The Japanese have a very delightful ceremony every year in which the spirits of the dead come back. Now this apparently arose in China originally in what we like to call ancestor worship. Now ancestor worship to us would be completely unbelievable or at least not very... Um, Likely, But in uh, China and Japan, ancestor worship is important. Now, the spirits come back, according to them. And they come back on a certain day of the year. And the family goes with lanterns to the cemetery to bring back the spirit of their relatives in a little procession to their home. They don't see the relative, but they know he's there. And they have a special seated table for him. And they give him a feast and a banquet. And they also know that he knows by reading their minds what their thoughts are. Therefore, it is necessary to have a pretty clean mind and uh, be sure that all is well. And when the uh, ancestor comes, he's going to be interested in certain things. And if he is pleased with what he sees, he will go back to the other world for another year and be very happy in a heavenly state. But if things on his living descendants are not good, and they have not kept the rules, then he goes back and he is very sorrowful. And it is a great mistake in Chinese and Japanese logic for the ancestors to be sorrowful, because there is only re one reason why they can be. And that is because their living descendants have failed. So what the ancestor wants to know, for example, is, is the family in debt? For before this ceremony, it is considered necessary that every bill be paid, even if you have to sell half the family belongings to do it. Also, that the spirit wants to know that the husband and wife are congenial, that they are happy together that they are working together for a common good, that all the children are happy and well-fed and all have had proper religious training and they are all obedient and they are all glad of the family they belong to. And they are taught in turn to be prepared so that when they grow up and their parents go into the world of spirits, that their parents will be always welcome to come back and find that their children are happy, contented, living well, working hard, cheerful, and religion-centered. Now, you may not believe in them coming back, but the end product has certain advantages. And that is that it makes these people want to try harder than most of us to keep the values which we must all keep if we expect to get along. It is the result value of these beliefs that we've lost. If we had some other way of making those values, it would be different. But when we took all of the gods out of the heavens, 
when we took all of the spirits out of the forests and of the lakes and the mountains, when we began to think in terms only of our own personal advantages in this world and forgot there was any other until too late, under those conditions we have sacrificed some beautiful superstitions to get a group of new, unpleasant superstitions which are just as unprovable. There is way, no way in which we can prove that there are not celestial beings. There is no way can, we can say that all the inhabitants of nature are visible to us because we have a very limited visual field. We would have to deny many experiences that we accept without question. And yet, in a mysterious way, we have lost the fantasy. We've lost the charm and beauty and wonder of the life uh, of these older people. A life in which there was much more individual integrity, even though there were many times of great trouble. But out of this also came another thought that uh, has supported uh, a better way of life than we have at the moment. And that is that the ancients who had these beliefs actually had what they believed to be irrefutable evidence that these beliefs were true. They realized what we find out in a different way. But they realized, even in their time, that the individual who violently breaks the rules of life nearly always suffers and probably always suffers, although perhaps sometimes we are not present to see the suffering, that those who have not love and beauty and truth in their hearts are sick. And they, in those days, found that all of the good things of life seemed to come to them from an invisible cause. They found that in sorrow and and misery that they wanted to raise up their voices in prayer. We still pray, because some way we know that beyond our unbelief, there is a great, but greater believing that is true. Now, we don't have to go back again to the superstitions of the past, but we do need to deepen our own believing. We need to have a greater resource in personal internal insights. Today, things are breaking more or less in that direction. More and more now, the importance of the unseen is regaining its domination in life. More and more, we are beginning to realize that we cannot live by bread alone, especially white bread. (laughs) We also are beginning to recognize the tremendous importance of visualizing a larger universe with greater rules, greater purposes, and greater achievements than those of one little planet. We also are coming more and more to realize that to discover the great truths of life, we will have to do what the old Indian did, or the Egyptian priest, or the Greek mystic, or the early Christian saint. We have to commune with life itself. We have to be still and know if we want to know what the rules are. We cannot simply take these rules from each other. We've got to search inside of ourselves for the source of these rules. We've got to make peace with our own inner lives. And we cannot do this without a recognition of a divine presence available to us at all times. So gradually there is a return of the mystics. There is a return of the belief in the sages and the saints of old. There is a greater need for the recognition that the processes of nature are not merely automatic. The Greeks believed that flowers and trees were taken care of by little elemental spirits who guarded them and guided their destinies, that everything that lives has a protector and everything that lives must in its own turn protect something else. Man, being a comparatively advanced creature, has many things it must protect. He must gain the wisdom and the will to be the good gardener in his planet. He must also be the kindly guardian and custodian 
of other forms of life less than his own. At the same time that he is serving, he is then earning the right to enjoy an intercession of power greater than his own. His religion must be based upon service. As he serves others, so he is served. As he brings joy to the life about him, a greater power brings joy and contentment to him. Everywhere in life there seems to be an intelligence working, working within each of us. And then long ago, someone came upon the very important realization that this divine power has its seat in us, that there is a tremendous divinity locked within each of us, and the face of that divinity is visible in our face. Actually, God has as many appearances as there are creatures, and the deities are all of them embodied within forms and work through these forms into manifestation. Through meditation upon the archetypal forms of these principles, we slowly transform the universe. It is no longer just a mass of laws and chemicals and processes. The universe suddenly becomes uh, what one of the Buddhist priests that I knew called it, the great commune. The universe is one vast culture. It is one tremendous world. It is a cosmic universal democracy. The universe presents equal opportunity for all and special privilege for none. This great commune has as its ultimate the gradual manifestation of its purpose and pattern in every structure that man himself builds. Architecture, according to the Vitruvian canons, was a human representation of the laws of life as they relate to stress and pressure and harmony of form and materials. Therefore, the building was a symbol of an invisible building composed of the eternal principles of mathematics and science. In the same way, everything that we construct, everything that we build in our own minds and hearts is based upon great archetypal forms that exist forever in nature. And all these archetypes are alive. They are not just dead things. There is nothing dead. Even the belief in death cannot kill us because there is something that is inside of us always. And this thing that is inside of us it symbolizes itself outward into various forms and manifestations. The Greek heroes represented those who had by internal achievement transcended humanity. They were still of the human family, but they had earned a conscious participation in the divine light. They were children of God who had discovered their heritage and were therefore chosen to perform the works of God. We call them saints. In other religions, they are called arhats, sages, initiates, adepts, whatever you wish to call them. But they represent those human beings who have found their way back to the realization of the divine plan. And as uh, Milton in his Paradise Lost unfolds the invisible structure of the universe, filling it with beings, all of them, of vital, powerful forces. So I suspect that one of these days our astronomers and physicists are going to rediscover that all these principles and energies and substances that they work with are beings. For there is no substance from the smallest atom floating in a sunbeam to the greatest galaxy which is not composed of life. Every unit of existence is alive. And wherever there is life, there is growth, unfoldment, evolution, process. Wherever there is life, the eternal is breaking through the temporal. That which must be is gradually achieving a victory over the mistakes, limitations, or frustrations that have resulted from ignorance. Therefore, always, everything is alive. 
And when a thing is alive, we approach it a little differently. When we find I have a little kitten or a puppy dog, uh, it's alive. Therefore, we feed it, and we cuddle it, and we love it, and we talk to it, and we believe in it, because we can see its life. But all around us are forms of life that we don't see so readily, and even if we do see them, we do not really feel their presence as we should. But sometime we're going to realize that there is nothing in the universe that has not a destiny of its own and that our labor in every case is to advance the destiny of the thing as it is, and not simply to bind it to our purposes. We have a destiny to fulfill. Everything is growing and moving, but it is growing and moving in an intelligent, living pattern. This is part of the burden of the mandala symbolism, which we find in many Asiatic countries. It is a picture of of the universe of values. It is a picture of space inhabited by life rather than by body only. It, every planet suddenly becomes a living thing. Every star is a divine principle. We may call this uh, a kind of belief. We may even liken it to heathenism. But the substance of it is inevitable. With a certain amount of reintegration, reinterpretation, we shall find that there is nothing in the universe except various stages of divinity. That this divinity, which we cannot estimate, we have symbolized in various ways. The symbolism is very humble, very inadequate. But after all, man is the highest creature that man knows. Therefore, he has made God in his own image. But this does not mean that he has made it merely in the image of the body of deity. The God that man has fashioned in his own image also contains within it the infinite potential that is also in the potential of man himself. Man who makes deity in his own image bestows upon this image the infinite capacities which man recognizes in himself. He realizes that actually this deity is a vast being, and man himself is a, small, a somewhat less vast being. But to the cells and atoms of his own body, man is a universe. And to some little tiny cell within his bloodstream, man is greater than the whole of creation as we see it, and every little cell it faces in its time the same black hole we are trying to explore in the cosmos. There is the cosmos within us. There is an infinite life, and every living thing in us is alive. And out of this pageantry, the ancients decided there were only two kinds of beings, both alike in principle, but one visible and the other invisible. One perceptible other beyond perception, but that there was no such a thing anywhere as death. There's no such a thing as the lack of life, and there's no living thing that is not controlled by a divine law. And in the embodiment or personification of that divine law, as it operates on all levels of nature, we have theology. And the mystery of all the deities is nothing more or less than man giving a being to a principle which operates. Man has made a, de a deity out of a reality which is invisible. But this reality he knows from daily living he shares in. He knows that he is alive. He knows that the greatest mystery of all is his own existence, and that this existence is impossible unless behind the visible form of things is a vast, invisible, causal pattern, the archetype of everything that is visible. And wherever the human being has created a picture of this archetype, he has made it up of beings, which become, in a sense, the personifications of processes. He makes them into beings because he has discovered in himself that processes are intelligent. The ray of the sun has not only its warmth, but it's wisdom. 
And every drop of water in the ocean is not only wet, but is composed of an infinite solicitude for life. All living things of every condition have moral purposes. All forces operate morally, and they are not immoral unless man attempts to dispose of them maliciously. Where the individual wishes to misuse a force, that force turns upon him. The force is never bad, but the force will correct the errors of the wayward. So all the t there is only one thing to really understand, and that is that we live in the visible half, in the visible hemisphere of a great unity of life. We live in something that is ever-living, ever-loving, ever-kind, ever-helpful, ever-searching to make us better, ever-contributing to the happiness which we all desire. And between us and this realization is a small material personality, a series of customs based upon misinformation and misinstruction, by means of which we have closed off the reality of the greater part of the universe in which we live. We have cut everything down to our own level. We have taken away from ourselves all the overtones. And the moment you take the overtones from music, you destroy the music. The most important part of life is the part we do not see, but we constantly experience. We feel it, we sense it, we know it exists. And it is this over-existence that justifies our mortal existence. And uh, in art particularly, we see this. But we observe with great... Uh, tribulation, so to say, the way in which we have gradually closed out that which we did not want to understand. We have tried to prove conclusively that existence is an amoral state. We want to believe that there are no integrities that can interfere with an individual doing what he pleases. We want to have the feeling that we are not disobeying anything because there is nothing to disobey. We want to live as we please. We want to advance the various causes without interference. And little by little, these materialistic instincts and appetites are getting us deeper and deeper into trouble. Now, uh, if at the end of the year, era of superstition, uh, we came into a wonderful scientific enlightenment, and everything has been better ever since. We might pause for a moment. But I think it is well to realize that the, as our idealism failed in our procedures of life, our materialism has moved us from one disaster into another. In the last hundred years of human civilization, while it has had the greatest materialistic enlightenment and has been preaching its code of materialism industriously, that this last hundred years is probably one of the most difficult and tragic the world has ever known. We have had many times before that were not good, but we have never before had the combination of the wisdom and experience that we now potentially possess and find ourselves using it as badly as we are using it today. So all of the advancements of science and education have not, generally speaking, protected the human being from his own mistakes. There's only way, one way in which he can be protected, and that is he's got to protect himself. And he's got to protect himself by not making the mistakes, because it's as in the case of health. An individual who is disobedient to the laws of health long enough finally reaches the point where his condition is incurable. So it is not possible for us to continue without ultimately getting into serious trouble. We need desperately to re remember the living universe and our responsibility to it. We do not have to worship the deity on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in Rome they're throwing out the sun in front and the moon behind. No one really believed in that. No one believed that God was an old gentleman. But everyone believed that the principle of wisdom, the sage, the great thinker, 
the grandfather, the, the wise one of old. They went to find the nearest thing they could use to picture something that they could not picture in its fullness. So deity became parent, and parent became like father or mother, and they gave the a basis of an artistry with these interpretations. The Hindus do not believe that God has many arms and many heads in our sense of the word, but they do believe that every head in the world is part of the divine head, and every arm is one of the divine arms. Every living thing is part of an abstract divinity that is the fullness of all things. To get some of this back a little bit and get back to the idea that we live in a family rather than an in its institution. We more or less institutionalize human society. We are living in a combination of a technical laboratory and a reform school. Uh, we are being guarded against our own mistakes by the people who are responsible for making most of the mistakes. This is not what it is. We are not born to live in a laboratory. We are not born to get, live in a constant condition of punishment or retribution or anxiety. We are here to live together as a visible part of the great unity of life. The unity of life which is the whole world, the whole universe, and every part of it is alive. And every part of it is something we can reach. One of the mysteries of prayer that has been a problem for a long, long time is how God listens to all the prayers. Well, the actor is that there is a God in the person who is praying, and that is available to him at all times. It is the divine part of himself with which he must form an occasional union. He must experience the presence of a power greater than his objective personality. And the pure power of life within himself is one with the life of all that exists, the divine power infinitely diversified. Gradually building in a little of this romantic tissue into our way of life, the gradual recognition that there are wonderful stories that are going to come true, and that the time is going to come when idealism is going to help everyone to live happily ever after. When we begin to realize this and live more in the charm, in the quietude, the peace, the joy of faith, belief, and the security of inner conviction, things are going to be much better all around. We have gained a little something of intellectual brittleness by our present course of procedure. But we've lost the power to love in a simple, honest way. We have lost that power of love which makes us wish to give of our love. In the Canticles of Solomon the King, the Song of Solomon, uh, the king, the wise king, describes love in three ways. First of all, he says in the opening part of the Canticles, my beloved is mine. About halfway through the book, he says, My beloved is mine, and I am my beloved's. And at the end of the book, he says simply, I am my beloved's. The self has disappeared. And this is part of the experience that we all have to have. But until we find the simple love of each other. We're not going to be able to experience, define, or image the love of God correctly until we experience all these better virtues within ourselves. We're going to live in a universe with a blank sky above us, filled with stars that we hope to conquer someday, but when we conquer them, we will still be born, we will suffer, and we will die, because this is not the way it was intended to be. Instead of that, we've got to restore the intangible world of beauty within ourselves. We've got to have our own legends and our own lore, our own mysteries. We're going to have to have our own fantasies, our own great music, great poetry, great artistry. We must restore these values 
or the lack of them will lock us forever in a materiality that has no existence except in ourselves. But we must release ourselves into the larger world which is practically populated with nothing but deities because every principle is there. Everything is great. And sometime we're going to reach up there and realize that among the deities which will exist in the world that was fashioned for it is humanity itself. We are of the gods. We are part of the gods. And it is our privilege and our duty to claim our heritage through right conduct. Only in this way and in these manners uh, can we understand the symbolism. But it's, it is a valid symbolism. It is a wonderful thing to realize that the ancients were wise enough to make everything alive and that we have been foolish enough to believe that we could kill anything. The only thing that we can really destroy, even temporarily, is our own hope. And we have done that long enough. So in the spirit of the highest aspect of spiritual conviction, we must not only restore the kingdom of heaven, but we must also restore the garden of earth, which we were supposed to take care of, and to make a beautiful place for all human beings to live. And when we do that, according to the promise, then the Lord will be with us in the cool of the evening, and we shall know the whole mystery of life. It's a problem of fantasy, perhaps, but fantasy that is stronger than life or death fantasy that is eternal. Well, I guess that's all for this time, folks. I have an announcement I'm going to ask if you'll be patient.